Exodus chapter 25 this evening. Pastor is going to be continuing his sermon series on wilderness wanderings. This evening's, this evening's title, The Pathway to His Presence. So we're looking at the first eight verses of chapter 25 of the book of Exodus. May we stand out of respect for the reading of the word of God. The word of God says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger's skins, and shittim wood. Oil for light, for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense. Onyx stones, and stones to be set in, in, in the ephod, and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them." Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much again for this time. They're allowing us to come together this evening. They allow us to come together and sing your praises, Lord, and now especially come to the time of the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you will prepare our hearts, and Lord, I pray that you will help us and prepare us to hear, Lord, your word, to hear from you. And Lord, I pray most of all that your spirit move among us. Lord, I pray that you move in a mighty way in our hearts, Lord, that we may hear from you, and Lord, that we may heed what you have to say. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. We're going to give this microphone a try again tonight as we preach. And uh, hopefully it works a little better than this morning. Uh, I hope you're ready to look into God's Word tonight. Uh, We're going to do a Bible study uh, of sorts. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a look at the tabernacle. And I'm going to try to cover a whole lot of content in uh, this one sermon to give you a good overview for the tabernacle that provides you a framework uh, for you to continue to study this out on your own. So we're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight. We're going to look at a lot of different things. So have your Bible ready, uh, be attentive, and uh, let's get into God's word together. We're following the children of Israel uh, as they journey through the wilderness uh, because they're not there yet, neither are we. Amen, church? And so tonight we're going to look at the tabernacle. Let's understand what the tabernacle is. The tabernacle was simply the tent. Uh, The tent that God had ordained for Israel to worship him uh, during their wilderness wanderings and really for many years while they were in the promised land uh, until Solomon really completed the temple. So the Bible tells us, though, in Hebrews that the tabernacle is a shadow or a pattern of heavenly things. It provides us a pattern for how to come to God, how to know Him, how to live in Him, how to enjoy His presence. Uh, For really, within the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God dwelt in the Shekinah glory. As we consider the tabernacle, understand this, that God's Presence is God's priority. In fact, you look at chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of details for the tabernacle. But before God begins to tell Moses about any other piece of furniture or about uh, this animal skin or that animal skin or this many rings or that many rings or, or this thing or that thing. What does God do? What does God begin to lay out first? You look at verse number 10. He begins to lay out the Ark of the Covenant. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. And a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And a cubit and a half the height thereof. And he goes through the details. You jump to verse number 22. And the Lord says, And I will meet with and I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, and of all the things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And so before they did anything else, they established the place of God's presence. Because God's presence has got to be priority. It's got to be priority. But by way of introduction, let me give you kind of three truths 
that can really help to shape our understanding of all the stuff we're going to look at with the tabernacle. And even as you read and study it on your own, number one, the first truth I want you to see by way of introduction tonight, I got two outlines, all right? Uh, The first thing I want you to see is the point. What's the point of the tabernacle? And that is simply this, that God desires to dwell among his people. That's the point. If you miss that, you've missed it. God desires to dwell among his people. We saw it in verse number 8 that Brother Charles read. And let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. Later on in chapter 29, beginning in verse 45, God reiterates this. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. 20, verse number 46. That, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them out of the land of Egypt. That I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. What is the the whole point, because you see, sometimes we can get lost in the details, right? How many rings per curtain, and how many this, and how many of that, and what's blue, and what's red, and why the badger skins, and why the goat skins, and why this, and why that, and why this sacrifice, and that sacrifice. The point of it all is that God desires to dwell among his people. You know, God still desires to dwell among his people. That's the point. That's the point. God desires to dwell among his people, to be the center of our lives, to be the source from which we process, live, and enjoy every breath. God desires to dwell among his people. So as we consider the tabernacle, number one, we have to consider the point. Simply what, church? What is the point? That God... So we have the point of the tabernacle. But as you go through all of this information on the tabernacle, I think you also need to understand the pattern of the tabernacle. And the pattern of the tabernacle, let me simply make this statement. It's simply this, God cares about the details. If the point is that God desires to dwell among his people, the pattern is that God cares about the details. God doesn't just tell them to build a tent. God gives them some crazy specific stuff. I mean, crazy specific, so specific that this portion of Scripture has probably derailed more people trying to read their Bible through in a year than any other portion of Scripture. Crazy specific stuff. But hear me, God cares about the details. You know, the truth is, you still come God's way or you don't come at all. The truth still is you either recognize God's pattern or you've got a real problem. We don't worship in our own way. How often we hear in this day and age, well, I just worship God my way and my time. And, you know, the Bible says worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and boy, I just do that. Well, we love the spirit part, but we, we, we kind of little light on the truth. Because you see, the thing about the truth is, the truth is a reflection of what reality is. And reality still is that God cares about the details. That the Bible still says that we ought to assemble together. Not forsake that as the manner of some is. That we ought to sing, that we ought to serve, that we ought to pray, that we ought to submit ourselves to the word, that we ought to give. That every man ought to purpose in his heart as God would have him give. And you see, when it comes to worship, I'm not worried about how many ringlets are on a curtain. But the reality is, God still cares about the details. And I'm not making this up after my own image. No, no, no. I either come His way or I don't come at all. And the sad thing is, there are many who live in delusion. Because they think somehow they are worshiping the Lord and they call themselves Christians, and yet they do not follow Christ. So when you look at the tabernacle, it helps you to keep from getting bogged down. you got to remember the point. The point of all of this, the point of it all is what, church? The point is that God desires to dwell among his people. So once we've got the point, we can begin to appreciate the pattern. And the pattern is what, church? Simply that God cares about the details. It does matter to God. It does. And then I want you to see, by way of introduction, not just the point, not just the pattern, but the process. And that is simply this. God desires our heart first. As you note, verse number two. 
before he got into anything, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. You see, worship has always been a matter of the heart. God wants my heart heart first. God does not force himself on anyone. And really, this is one of the great first lessons that the tabernacle can teach us, that that all worship and all knowledge of God begins with a willing heart. And that if we don't come with a willing, open, contrite heart, then we are not truly coming to God. You see, you can come to church without a willing heart. And you can be among the people of God and hear the songs of God and sit under the word of God and you can miss the whole thing. You see, boy, we look at the law and we see like rule after rule after rule after. It, sometimes it's, it's we lose sight of the heart. But you see, before God ever talked about how many ringlets were to be in any curtain and, and before God ever talked about what color the badger skins were supposed to be, God reminded them that worship is a matter of the heart. A matter of the heart. What's the point of the tabernacle, church? The point is that God desires to dwell among his people. What is the pattern that we see? It's simply this. God cares about the details. Finally, the process. What is this whole process of worship? It's simply this. God desires our heart first. And I think if we keep those things in mind as we begin to look at the tabernacle and pull some of these things out, I think there'll be a real help to us in this service and you in your study as you go through it. As we understand our need for God and God's desire for us to know Him, what we're going to find tonight is that the tabernacle, and really we're going to focus tonight on the items that make up the physical tabernacle. The items that make up the physical tabernacles can help provide us a picture of what it is to have a path to His presence. So I've got a little image. I think they got my, my uh, picture that I sent over in the outline in the email. Let's see if that goes up there. Ah, yes. And so uh, you can see uh, we, we've thrown up here a nice little very plain image of the tabernacle. That would be the square rectangle looking things in blue. And then the different pieces of furniture that were found therein. And so you see up at the top the most holy place. We might call that the holy of holies. We have there the ark of the covenant. That is where the presence of God dwelt. That is where as we talk about a pathway to his presence in essence that's what we're talking about for you and I tonight to know the presence of God in our lives to know the glory of God in our lives in an intimate way but we see the path to get there that there are several items several pieces of furniture to help us along the way the first thing I want to look at is what we're going to call the brazen altar the brazen altar and we find this described for us in Exodus chapter 27. Exodus chapter 27. If you want to turn over there, we'll read a couple of verses together. Verses 1 and 2 of Exodus 27 tell us, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long, and five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof, and the horn shall be the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Then it goes on to talk about the pans for the ashes and uh, some of the other things, the grate that would go on it. Verse number 4, a network of brass that would perform the grate of this. Uh, but basically, the first piece of furniture that we come to, and you can put the diagram back up there, is the brazen altar, or on our picture it says the altar of sacrifice. To give you kind of a modern day picture or equivalent, uh, we would maybe picture this as a, a, a big square barbecue pit. We can get our heads around that, right? Good big square barbecue pit. And this is where the Old Testament sacrifices would take place. 
And so we have here the picture. It looked like a big barbecue pit. And it, it has here this Old Testament purpose. That it was to be the place of sacrifice. It was here that the sacrifices for sin and other things would be brought and offered before the Lord. And really, it's a pretty messy place. Because you read the things that would happen on the, uh, the brazen altar or the altar of sacrifice. It, it would be here that the, the lambs or the oxen, that the, the, the turtle doves and other things would be, would be slaughtered. It would be here that their blood would be drained, that their intestines and entrails would be dealt with. And it would be here that the animals would be chopped up and different parts of it uh, sacrificed and burnt. Different parts of it used for different purposes depending on what the depending on what the sacrifice was. But you have to understand that this, this wasn't a one time a year or one time a week or even a one time a day occurrence. I mean, the people is, they would, uh, the priests is they would offer for the people morning and night. The people is they would bring their trespass offerings or their sin offerings or, or other things throughout the days. You think about the millions of people and the sacrifices that would be brought over and over and over and over again. You had a bloody, gory reminder that there needed to be a place of sacrifice because the price of sin is death. Before we get anywhere near the most holy place, we are reminded that the price of sin is death. You know, the New Testament confirms that reality for us. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse number 22, the writer of Hebrews says, And almost all things are by the law purged without blood, or with blood, sorry, and without shedding of blood is no remission. For church, aren't you grateful for the Lord Jesus? Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse number 10, it says, By the which will we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And I'm so grateful. We have this Old Testament picture where the blood of bulls and goats for a season, they, they covered sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ washes them away. And once for all, all who will receive his sacrifice have that sin debt paid. We find here as we engage on a journey to the pathway to his presence, to, to experience in the person, the presence, and the glory of God, it starts with an altar, a place of sacrifice. Reminding us that the price of sin is death. I hope tonight as we do this study, I hope that you, I hope you have the blood of Jesus to your account. I hope that you have made the decision to put your faith and trust in him and his finished work on Calvary. I hope, I pray. If that is the case, may I say before I move beyond this point that if you're here tonight, you're watching by way of Facebook, listening by way of radio, and you don't know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. You don't know for sure that the blood of Jesus Christ stands for you. Why don't you get it settled even tonight? The brazen altar. Well, as we continue on our journey to the presence of God, we, we move past the brazen altar, and what we're going to find next is we're going to find a laver. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, if you would. This next piece of furniture on our journey. And here we are going to begin by looking at verse number 18. The Lord is speaking to Moses, and he says, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass. And his foot also of brass to wash withal. 
And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. And when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near unto the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to them and to his seed throughout their generations. So we, we see the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice. The next thing we see is the laver. If I could describe this to you, it would be like a big shiny bird bath. Um, if any of you remember what a bird bath looks like. And so you kind of have a pedestal and then it broadens out at the top. This one's got one at the bottom too. So it's kind of like a big old double decker bird bath. Um, but it's not designed for birds. It was designed for the priests to be able to wash their hands and to wash their feet after performing the sacrifices. Uh, the bloody gory sacrifices that they had made, they needed to wash themselves before they went any further further into the presence of God. And so we see the Old Testament purpose here that the laver was a place of cleansing. It was a piece of mirror-like, highly polished brass. And it was placed between the altar and the tabernacle. Between the altar and the tabernacle. You know, this Old Testament purpose is beautifully translated into the New Testament. You know, Christians, we ought not expect to come into God's presence with dirty hands. You know, the Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus is committed to having a clean bride. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 26, it, it reminds us that he might sanctify and cleanse it, speaking of the church with the washing of water by the word. The Lord Jesus is committed to having a clean bride. And we ought not be presumptuous to, to think that we're going to march into the presence of God with hands, with feet, with lives that are spotted by this world. As Christians, we must inspect ourselves in the Word and come for a cleansing. You know, the Word is like a spiritual mirror. James chapter 1 gives us that analogy, if you would, beginning in verse number 22. It says, but be ye here doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. The picture is somebody who would see himself in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, verse number 24, and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So we have a man who's looked at himself. He's unkept. He's not gotten ready. He's not washed. He's not brushed his hair. He's not brushed his teeth. He's not ready for the day. And he sees himself and goes, ah. Okay, and then goes on his way and thinks nothing else of it. Well, most of us would not go to work that way. Most of us wouldn't go to the grocery store that way. Most of you wouldn't sit on the front porch that way. Let's be honest. And yet James says how many Christians are guilty of doing that spiritually all the time. We go to look into the Word and we go, oh yeah, that's not right. Oh, oh, I... Lord moves, I need to work on that. God, I need to deal with something. Maybe even this morning, the Holy Spirit was, was prodding and, and moving in our hearts. And, and you know what we did? We acknowledged, you know what? That's not really what it needs to be. And then we walked away. And we haven't thought another thing of it. You see, we do stuff spiritually all the time that we would never do physically. Verse 25, but he that looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Jump down to verse 27 if you would. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Here's the thing. We walk in a really dirty world. And if we're not taking time on the regular 
to look into the mirror of the Word and to wash ourselves with the water of the Word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, the psalmist asked, by taking heed thereto according to thy Word. If we're not coming on the regular to the mirror and the cleansing water of the Word of God, I'm going to tell you, we are not where we need to be. And we will never get where we want to be in regards to the presence of Almighty God. And so we have the altar of sacrifice. Go ahead and throw that uh, picture back up if you would, Liz. We have the altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar. We have the laver. And then we're going to enter into the holy place. We are going to enter into the tabernacle. And now you'll notice in there that there are three pieces of furniture inside the tabernacle. We have the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. Let's handle those very quickly. We'll start number three with the table of showbread. Turn back, if you would, to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to look at verse number 23 and 24. There the Lord says, And thou shalt make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. And make thereunto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about it. And thou shalt make a golden crown or, or a ledge or an edge to the border thereof round about. And they made it in such a way that the table of showbread could, could house 12 loaves. 12 loaves. To give you a picture, it's a short table, about three foot by a foot and a half, with 12 loaves of bread on it. And we have here the Old Testament purpose. Uh, the table of showbread was a place of fellowship and communion. Literally, the word showbread means the bread of my face or the bread of my presence. And so it has that idea of fellowship, communion, openness. And this would be something that the priests would partake of. They would partake of the bread, the loaves uh, that were on this table. They would partake of that food together every Sabbath. The priests would partake of that food every Sabbath. And so we have the Old Testament purpose but we also have that New Testament picture. The spiritual food that God provides us is the living and written word of God. Jesus said of himself in John 6 in verse number 35. He said, I am the bread of a life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We see Jesus said of the written word of God in Matthew 4 and verse number 4, that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so we find here in the table of showbread, spiritual fellowship and food necessary for the life of worship that we desire. So we see one of the pieces there being the table of showbread. We see another one being the candlestick. Stay in Exodus 25, if you would. Look just a few verses down, beginning in verse number 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made in his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, his flowers shall be of the same. Six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. So basically what we have here is we have a solid gold menorah-like thing. It probably weighed little more than 100 pounds and was probably worth a little more than $5 million. Gold ain't cheap. So we have a solid gold menorah of sorts. The Old Testament picture here that this was the place of light. Inside of this heavy tent, this was the only source of light in the holy place. Pure olive oil was the only fuel that was used for that light. 
and the candlestick was to be cared for on a daily basis. The New Testament counterpart is fairly obvious. God has given us the spiritual light we need. If we want into the presence of God, if we want a deeper experience and appreciation for the glory of God. I'm going to tell you, we don't have to wonder. God has given us light. You know, the Holy Spirit is a source of the believer's spiritual light for understanding and direction. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John 16 in verse number 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. And whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. But we also have light through the word of God, don't we? Psalm 119, 105 tells us, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have, we have light in God's word. So we have light in the spirit that dwells within us. We have light in God's word that we hold in our hand. Jesus himself is the light of the world. John 8 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Hey, we have light. God has blessed us abundantly with light. But just like the candlestick and the tabernacle had to be cared for on a daily basis, the practice of walking in the Spirit, the practice of living by God's Word, the practice of following Jesus is something that has to be cared for on a daily basis. We see the candlestick. Finally, the last item that we saw inside the tabernacle, inside the holy place, was the altar of incense. Flip back, if you would, to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. Here, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense thereupon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. Jump down, if you would, to verse number 7. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And it was very particular about what kind of incense they could and could not burn. So the picture here that we have is a small, square, solid gold, or a gold, laid, a gold overlaid altar placed directly before the veil leading into the Holy of Holies. And the purpose here in the Old Testament was to provide a sweet-smelling savor. Now this is going to provide a pretty stark contrast, because... If you'll remember, Liz, if you could put that picture back up for me. Where did we begin our journey? We began our journey where? At the altar of sacrifice. And you think about the process of slaughtering an animal, of burning an animal. You think about a, a burnt offering. There, you, you think about your barbecue. We likened it to a barbecue. There is a point at which things smell good, and then at a certain point, things smell very bad. To understand that largely the courtyard reeked of death and smoldering flesh. The Lord arranged it so that as the priest would come to enter into the presence of God, it would not be that stench of death that would lead them into the presence of God. But it would be the beauty of that incense by which they would be invited into the presence of God. Something that Aaron performed morning and evening. A perpetual incense before the Lord, the Bible says, throughout their generations. I find it interesting that often the Bible describes our prayer as sweet-smelling incense before the Lord. 
in the book of Psalms, Psalm 141 in verse number two, the Bible describes it this way. Psalm 141, it says, let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up mine hands as the evening sacrifice. In fact, this is one of the most incredible things to me. The, the temple that we see in heaven, we, we know that there is a heavenly temple. And the temple that we see in heaven in the book of Revelation, you, you look at the picture that's laid out, Revelation chapter 8, and beginning in verse number 3. The Bible says, And another angel came and stood at the altar. This is that, this is that, uh, this is that the, the temple in heaven in the presence of God, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Upon the golden altar which is before the throne. You see what God gave them as a picture. Was a picture of that temple. That place of worship in heaven. And the smoke of the incense which came which, with the prayers of the saints. Ascended up before God. Out of the angel's hands. What a beautiful thing that our prayers are likened unto this incense. Ushered into the presence of God. And yet we know that our access to the throne of God is only through the Lord Jesus. Only through Christ. And there we have it. Put the picture back up if you would, Liz. So we start at the altar of sacrifice. Because we are reminded that the wage of sin is death. We, we have the laver. We have the pieces of furniture on the inside, the table of showbread, that place of communion and sustenance. We have the candlestick, that place of light. We have the altar of incense, that place of that sweet-smelling savor that, that, that ushers us into the presence of God. And, and you think about, you think about this. What is the purpose of the tabernacle? Church, remind me, what is the point of it all? The point is what? That God desires to dwell among his people. That is the point, right? What what did we see was the priority before God told us about anything else. God established where his presence would be. God wants to dwell among us. God wants us to enjoy his presence. He desires that. And I look at what God has provided. Put the picture back up, Liz. The Israelites dwelt with the presence and glory of God among them, but they missed it. The Israelites, their great privilege of having the very presence of God among them, what did it do? It turned into form, it turned into regulations, it turned into duty. That which should have presented the greatest blessing ultimately became one of their great burdens. That which should have provided them life ultimately became lifeless. You know, God wants us to know the fullness of God in our life. God wants us to know his power and his presence. In church, we can know his power and presence in our lives. Remember, we have here this pattern. We have here this pattern about how we can come to God and how we can know God, how we can live in his presence and in his power. And yet, how many who name the name of Christ, like Israel of old, are prone to leave faith and settle for form? It's a pretty apt description of the church at large today, 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 5, that they have a form of godliness, and yet they deny the power thereof. Put it back up, Liz. The point is that God might dwell among his people. But church, how do we get to that most holy place? How do we get to that holy of holies where we know God's presence in such a powerful and real way and we know God's glory in such a real way? How do we get to that place? Well, I got good news. God has provided the sacrifice. God has provided the sacrifice. Amen. I got better news. Well, not better news than that. Compounding better news. We'll go with that. 
Not only has God provided the sacrifice, but God has provided the bread of life. Amen? God has not only provided the sacrifice and the bread of life, he, he has provided the light of life as well. You know what God's even provided? He's not only provided the sacrifice, he's not only provided the bread of life, he's not only provided the light of life, he has provided access to his throne. We can, through Jesus Christ, bring our prayers before the very throne of God. That incense, that sweet smelling savor. But what's the missing link? What so often separates us from that most holy place? I believe with all my heart, it's because we want to skip the laver. We're grateful for Jesus. And we're grateful for the bread of life. And the, we're grateful for the, for the light of life. And we're grateful for the opportunity to pray. And we're grateful for all those things. But church, what keeps us from the fullness of the presence of God? I believe it's because we, we want to skip the laver. We're not real good at looking into the mirror of God's word and really allowing God's word to get us clean. You see, we've been we become comfortable with dirty hands. We become comfortable with dirty feet. We look, but we don't want to look real close. We 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 do Wash, but we don't want to do anything too radical. What might somebody, what might they think if they knew I struggled with sin? It's because we skipped the labor. And yet the psalmist says in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, the psalmist asks, Who? shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands. It's been a long time since the church of Jesus Christ was truly broken over their sin. Sadly, I think it's been a long time since most of us have been overly bothered by our sin. And it's not because we're that holy. It's not because we've come that far. It's because we have come to a place where we are comfortable. We've not been called to be comfortable. We've been called to be clean. the pathway to his presence, God has provided for it all. Praise him for his sacrifice. Praise him for his bread of life. Praise him for the light. Praise him for the ends. Praise him for all of it. But don't skip the labor. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in that holy place? He that hath clean hands. And that church is the pathway to his presence. Father, we.